All right, you're ready to open the Bible. You want to study for yourself. You want to learn. And, and you, you don't even know where to start. You don't know where to begin. Or maybe you've been studying the Bible for a long time and you're just looking for better tools. Maybe you've been having people provide studies for you that you've been going through and those have been fruitful, but you want to step this up a little bit more and do some of this yourself. I'm Brian Catherine with SaltyBeliever.com and my goal is to take a series of videos and just talk about good Bible study tools. And hopefully they'll be beneficial to you and it's something you can take and, and, and know God's Word better by using these tools and then loving God more because you're understanding His Word well. That's what I would like to do. But before we can even look into all these tools, we need to start with the question, what is the process by which I'm going to study God's Word? How am I going to do this? Where do I start? What's the, what's the pathway through a good study? And, and will it get me to where I would like to end up? These are the right questions, and a lot of times we just take them for granted. But let's think about this for a minute. Let's say your pathway is um, open the Bible and take whatever it says and directly apply it to me right now. Well, that, that, that could be a little bit problematic. Um, for example, without a, a good pathway, without good tools, we could take something like a Jesus statement that says, we're like, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, and cast it, cast it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and cast it away because it's better to enter heaven without a hand or without an eye than to enter hell because of sin. Okay. Most of us would recognize that's probably hyperbole. And, and there's a, there's a, speaking tool that Jesus was using to his audience. And if we don't think about that tool, we don't apply uh, our understanding of hyperbole, we just end up chopping our hand off and gouging our eye out, not understanding the bigger picture. That's a, that's a pretty big, probably, probably extreme example. But we see these sorts of problems a lot when we apply things directly without thinking about the various tools. So if we have a good system, we know at what point and how and why we apply tools and why we do that. So I remember when I was first learning to study the Bible, the system that I learned, and, and I, I, it served me really well, looked like this. It asked the question, what did the Bible say then? Okay, so original audience. Uh, this is a question mark. If you can't see that, maybe I'll just take that away. What, what was being said then and 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 how, we, we need to find the timeless principle. Okay, we need to extract something, meaning, so that we can apply the timeless principle to now, me, my life. right? And what we're not doing is making that jump from whatever it said then immediately to what it says now. We're going through a process of, of finding a timeless principle and then taking that timeless principle and, and using good tools to get that to apply uh, to me now. And a lot of Bible studies do something like this. Uh, this is good. This helped me really well, except uh, some of my pathway and process didn't take me through some of the right paths. But the tools I was using was how do I understand then? How do I find the timeless principle? How do I apply? And various tools were doing different things. Maybe you have seen a Bible study. This is very popular. It comes from... Uh, well, it's made popular at least by uh, Howard Hendricks and Living by the Book. This is a really good how to study the Bible book if you're interested. Uh, he, he really advocated for a process, fairly popular process, now known as O-I-A. O-I-A. Where, whereas O stands for observation. And this is where you apply certain tools where you get a really good look into the context, what the Bible is saying, what do you see, what do the words mean. Uh, you, all kinds of different tools will help you unpack that. How do we make sense of narrative versus poetry versus um, discourse? Like, so you observe the passage that you're reading and then you look for the interpretation or you interpret it or you find the meaning or the timeless principle, right? And then, so first this gets you to here and then you do this work. And then once you understand that you have an interpretation of meaning and you've been able to put all the tools into practice, then you can apply that to your own life. This is OIA and this is kind of the backbone of almost every good Bible study. OIA, observation, interpretation, 
application. That's a pretty good pathway. And then different tools fit <clears throat> into different spots here. And so then uh, <clears throat> another really popular method sort of modifies the OIA method. It's called coma. And actually this M is kind of like an I and you actually get another OIA. But what coma does is it says, let's not forget context because a text taken out of context now becomes incredibly dangerous. What, what's the context? This is reminding the person doing the study, like don't forget the original audience and what it's trying to say. So context, what's the context? What am I looking at? Where does this fit in the Bible? And then, then that takes us to observation and we've seen this with OIA. And then that takes us to M for meaning. So context, observation, meaning, application. And, and meaning is kind of the same as the interpretation. So. Is coma better than OIA? Well, if you don't remember context, then that's a helpful, very helpful tool. But the reality is in the OIA method, context is part of the observation process. You use the context tools, original audience tools, when you're doing the O part of OIA. And this thing gets expanded more and more and more to the point where I've seen um, an OIA expanded in greater detail to, to multiple different parts and pieces. But a lot of these pieces, if you're gonna be reminding the student of the Bible anything, context is good, but I think gospel should probably be the piece that gets added. So there is a method that I really like. I've sort of adopted this in my own sermon preparation, class preparation, and I first saw this with the uh, Charles Simeon Trust stuff. Uh, David Helm is a big advocate for this. And basically, it looks a little bit like this. So, so, um, you have the, the text, right? And we need to understand what it meant to the original audience. So I'm gonna put like original audience, okay? Well, this is context, right? We're, we're getting context. And there's a whole set of tools that can be used right here to help us do this work. And so we use those tools. And then, and this is where the step that's really helpful, <clears throat> once we understand the original audience, meaning what it meant then, I'll just put a then. We need to we need to reflect on this. They call this maybe a theological reflection or just a gospel reflection. How does the, the death, burial, resurrection, the perfect life, the ascension, all the pieces of what Jesus Christ did, how does that shape and inform what this message was and, and how it brings us to today. So we run it through this lens of how the gospel shapes it. And then we bring it to now. Then we bring it to, to today. Right. And there's a series of tools that we can use to help us to understand this part and this part and even this part. And if you're a preacher or a teacher, uh, the Charles Simeon Trust, where, I, where I've seen this before, uses tools to help us to communicate it and teach it. But also, there's just a process of understanding how, how does this work today? And the reason I love this little picture is because if we circumnavigate these steps, right? If, if you figure out, you know, what did the original audience, uh, how did they understand it? How did they take this? How was it intended? And you bypass the cross, and you kind of go this way. You, they, they do a much better job teaching this than I do. If you're going from here to here, you end up with this, this moralism um, which is not going to be healthy and it's not going to get you to what the Bible's trying to say. It's going to get you to something else. Or if you just go straight from the text up to, you know, here's the cross, here's Jesus, and then we take that to today, then you sort of end up with this, this spiritualization that takes things out of its appropriate context, and then you have the risk of losing the appropriate meaning and, and you end up with some pretty weird places. Or, uh, like we had talked about at the very beginning, if you just go straight to today, you end up with all kinds of problems bypassing all of it. And so this, this is a pretty good pathway. I believe that's what they call this. This is the, a pathway for Bible study. You take the text, you understand what, it, what it's communicating, what its structure might be. You understand how the original audience, the original author were, were hopefully trying to communicate because you can't, you can't take these things out of time and place and space and all that. Then you understand how the gospel speaks to it, and then you figure out, okay, how do you apply that today? All of these things have great tools that help us in those places. The key to all of this, though, is to have a good pathway, to have a, a really good process. And so for me, in sermon prep and class prep, I use 
a process, a series, that basically just helps me keep things constrained so I don't get tempted to jump ahead, to, to jump to things that I haven't really done the right study for. So for me, um, again, a lot of this I've learned through some really great Bible teachers and, and preachers, but I like to start with understanding what is the structure of the text I'm reading, what is the what is here, then I move to a section of, okay, what's the context and what, and I'm using tools along the way, what's the biblical background and what's the systematic theology that speaks into this and the biblical theology and the historical events that were happening in the day and where is this in the Bible and, and how does this play out in, in sort of the whole meta narrative of the Bible? Like I, That's where I put that kind of study in it to try to really figure out what is the, the original intention and the, how did the original audience hear this and and then and I just stick to that I don't I try not to jump quickly to what what do I do with this and uh, how does the gospel play I try to I try to just anchor into these steps so that I don't get ahead of myself then from there I say what was the what was the message the original author was trying to communicate to the original audience what was happening then my next question is how does the gospel influence this message and, and where does the gospel message fit with this in the whole of the Bible. That way I'm not jumping ahead or spiritualizing or moralizing. Um, and then from there I say, okay, well, how does, how does this message then speak to today? How it went through basically what it meant then through the lens of the gospel, how does it speak today? And then at that point, and so I see, I see there, this is where I find meaning. And then as a teacher, I go, okay, how am I going to teach this? What are the applications that come of this? How, how does this play out? So the point I'm getting at is you have to have a good process. You need a good pathway. Then you know where the tools fit and how to apply the tools. There is a ton of different processes and pathways out there. And a lot of them don't do a lot of this. They skip steps. They skip the gospel or they skip original audience. Or, you know, sometimes it's just, what does this mean to you? And we've just jumped straight from text to today. And we've, we've missed all these steps. So when you do that, you're, you're taking away a great opportunity to engage with tools that will help you sort of unpack and unlock various things and see this for what God would have us to see it in. We, you don't want to miss that. So my encouragement in this video is have a good process. Have a good pathway. If nothing else, OIA, observation, interpretation, application. And remember that in the observation stage, you're, you're bringing in original audience and context and all those sorts of pieces. In the interpretation or meaning phase, you're bringing in how the gospel uh, affects that whole thing. In the application phase, you're bringing it to today. OIA. Simple, easy. I hope this helps you. My encouragement to you is that you would have a process.